Celebrating 45 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, Tom Dilsack on the hot seat about opening up CRP acres. Plus, speaking of a food crisis, the World Food Program says Ukrainian ports should open now. In Southern Gardening, do you have the Midas touch? Gary talks about going for gold in the landscape. And in this week's feature, demand for meat has one local meat locker overloaded. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Great to have you with us again here on Farm Week. With inflation and potential food shortages on the mind of everyone, the Senate Ag Committee met to discuss the situation and what to do about it. Among those testifying, the head of the USDA, Tom Vilsack. John Torpy has the story. Well, the challenge would be for American agriculture to innovate. Uh, USDA to Secretary to Tom Vilsack was on Capitol Hill this week to answer a myriad of questions from the Senate Agriculture Committee. Top of mind for committee members was USDA's response to the threat of a global grain crisis. I appreciate the announcement from the USDA made this morning that will allow some additional flexibilities for those with expiring CRP contracts. While Bozeman celebrated the action, he urged USDA to take a step further to ensure an increase of acres for planting. One suggestion is looked to the past. In the 2014 Farm Bill, landowners enrolled in the Conservation Reserve Program were given an opportunity to end their contracts early without penalty. We should give serious consideration to this, to this penalty-free incentive again until grain production returns to normal. I believe this flexibility would allow potentially millions of acres to return to food production. The world cannot afford for prime farmland to lie fallow. Under a rule change announced Thursday, participants in the last year of their conservation reserve program agreement won't have to wait until October 1st to begin farming the CRP ground. We're basically suggesting that they can now voluntarily terminate without penalty for those roles that are now coming, or those acres that are now coming out of the program so that they'd be in a position to, to do work now. The one-time rule change is aimed at increasing plantable acres, one of the ways the agency is addressing the forecasted world grain shortage. Some committee members voice concern over the use of the herbicide glyphosate, which some see as a needed tool on grain farming operations. The U.S. Department of Justice recently took a new unprecedented position on glyphosate that could cripple the effective use of this very important ag product that we count on. If our farmers cannot use safe, common sense, and effective products, what would happen to U.S. crop yields? We have to continue to look for ways in which we can invest in and encourage additional research and development. Uh, on a wide variety of, of initiatives, including crop protection. Uh, we need to continue to work with our, our industry to make sure that innovation uh, is, in, that we invest in innovation. The White House is looking to stabilize trade and supply chains disrupted by COVID, and more recently, the invasion of Ukraine. World leaders met last week to discuss strategy, many talking about the urgency of opening ports in Ukraine. Peter Tubbs has that story. As the Russian invasion of Ukraine drags on, observers are concerned about the availability of grain from the region to feed the global population. Still 25 million tons of grain and oil seeds left in Ukraine. That's the third of last year's harvest. So we, we already have a huge logistical problem. Huizinga moved to Ukraine 20 years ago and manages 37,000 acres of farm ground. The stocks of last year's crops still in storage will soon be in the way of this summer's harvest. The main logistical bottleneck is the closed port at Odessa. While the city remains under Ukrainian control, the Russian Navy continues to limit shipping in the Black Sea to only Russian ports. The only option is to get the grain out of Ukraine is through the Black Sea ports. They have to be opened. That's the only option. The World Food Program is warning that an inability to distribute grain from the Black Sea region will lead to famine in dozens of countries, which could lead to political destabilization in multiple parts of the world. 
We have 49 million knocking on famine's door right now in 43 countries. I could tell you which 43 countries very well will have famine, destabilization, and mass migration. There's only one solution to getting the food, the grains, out of Ukraine. It's the ports, the ports in the Odessa region. They grow enough food to feed 400 million people. That's off the market. And the only way you get it back into the market is though, are the ports have to be opened back. In other news, much happening, including important news from the USDA, the Forestry Department, and other sources. Jonah Holland has all that and more in this week's Newswire. Jonah? Thanks, Mike. A busy week. Let's get right into it. Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack announcing more effort by the USDA on behalf of poultry producers. He says the USDA is committed to strengthening the meat supply chain under the Packers and Stockyards Act, a new transparency rule to protect poultry growers. Also, the Ag Department spending $200 million to provide loans and grants helpful to meat and poultry facilities. And finally, another $25 million to bolster workforce development. So, a lot of money being spent to help the meat industry. A bipartisan effort to cut red tape on U.S. humanitarian aid being shipped overseas has union opposition. In a letter to Congress, labor unions said that a plan to ease shipping rules would, quote, come at the expense of American businesses and working families. Current law mandates that half of U.S. food aid be shipped on U.S. vessels, a rule that Iowa Senator Joni Ernst says increased shipping costs by $52 million a year. Her widely supported measure would temporarily waive that requirement. Turns out, according to investigators, that a plan burned by the U.S. Forest Service contributed to what ultimately became the biggest wildfire in the history of New Mexico. The Calf Canyon Fire and the Hermit's Peak Fire merged in late April, but investigators say it was a planned burn in January that survived the winter and ultimately contributed to more than 315,000 acres being burned. The Forest Service has announced a pause in such burns while it conducts a review. Yet another fire in the food supply chain, this one at a commercial egg farm in Minnesota over the Memorial Day weekend. Investigators say the fire happened late at night at a Forsman Farms facility Saturday and estimate that as many as 200,000 chickens were killed in the blaze. The fire comes not long after a similar fire in Jones County, Mississippi in early May. There, two chicken houses were completely destroyed in an overnight fire. And finally in the newswire, almonds are California's biggest crop, but because of drought and price woes, producers fear the worst. Almond crops require a lot of water to grow, and the nation's western drought has definitely hurt, especially since almond trees take seven years to begin producing. And now, with gas prices up, the cost of shipping almonds has hurt farmers even more. Finally, inflation has inspired consumers to can some of their foods. Bottom line, experts say almond acreage is likely down this year. Farmers may turn to other crops to survive. Mike? Thanks, Jonah, and we'll post more news on our Facebook page. You can follow us there. On the lighter side, think you might have the Midas touch? In today's Southern Gardening segment, it just might be a little easier than you think to find that pot of gold in your landscape. Here's Gary Bachman with more. Foundation plantings are a must for most landscapes, where they act as anchors and supporting characters. But I really love shrubs that shine in the landscape, and these golden selections fit that criteria. Sunshine Ligustrum is a dense, upright growing evergreen shrub with all year golden foliage. Reaching three to six feet tall, it tolerates pruning, or when left unpruned, it develops airy and loosely curving stems. This is an easy care plant that does not require frequent maintenance. Golden Euonymus is an evergreen shrub displaying dense, bold green and gold variegated foliage on an upright growth habit. This easy to care for plant is tolerant of poor soil conditions and requires minimal care once established. Nightlight Camisiparis is a striking evergreen shrub with a dense, rounded habit. This shrub has colorful yellow foliage that becomes bronze and green in the winter. This shrub tolerates sunny conditions without experiencing leaf scorch during the summer months 
or winter cold burn during the colder months. And Kaleidoscope abelia changes color with the season. This is a variegated evergreen shrub with foliage that emerges bright yellow and lime green and transitions to golden yellow and finally warm oranges and reds in the fall. This is a dwarf selection perfect for small gardens or spaces. Try planting some of these golden shrubs to add some spice to your foundation plantings. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Garden. We'll take a short break right here, but stick around for a great family story, the ebb and flow of the meat business. Congress still trying to level the playing field, but meantime, some local meat lockers are cranked up big time. We'll visit a family-owned shop that went from slow and steady two years ago to booked out more than a year. It may not always be this way, but they're drawing customers from all over, even though for some the sticker shock for a side of beef is, well, shocking. A meat locker overloaded, coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith, and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions, and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership that these are the keys to democracy and that people when given facts they understand will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations, and their faith. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report. Row crop's still the biggest issue. That's right, Mike, and supply is the reason, and we'll be talking about that and more. But first, the numbers, mostly a repeat of last week with a few exceptions, then an update on the wheat market. Price is still going down, but supply is still tight. And finally, the same with soybeans, only the prices haven't fallen yet. Markets pretty evenly split last week. Row crop still inching down with one exception, while livestock up a touch. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, wheat down 11 and a quarter cents. We'll be getting into why in a moment. Last week's biggest gain, lumber up about 33 and a half dollars and soybeans up 27 cents. So, wheat slowly going down in price despite supply crunch on all row crops. Why would that happen? Panic buying? Well, looks like the price rose too high and we're seeing a correction. Market analyst Don Rose says too many issues, looks like the price will stay up is the bottom end. I think what this market's about is trying to sort out what the uh, risk management is in the market as we're trying to figure out what the world supply is. Are we moving into a food crisis? I, it seems like in the wheat we have one problem after another. If it's not the Russian Ukraine, it's the uh, Indian problem. Um, so yeah, a lot of issues on the table. So I think how a producer, what's he do? And I think that's both for the end user and the producer themselves. Uh, the producer, make sure you protect the bottom line. Uh, when you add some break-even levels, then look at programs that you can use uh, uh, from risk management. If you're uh, 
uh, just want to stay away from margin exposure, use some different tools. But And for the end user, I think you have to make sure and guard the crush because, you know, these are historically big prices. We've had some other uh, times where we had some black swans and the markets just fall out of bed. Now, right now, I can tell you the trade is positive, wants to be positive, thinks that the world supplies are uh, impossibly tight. We keep running into one problem after another. If it's not our spring planning, it's the uh, uh, dryness in India with wheat, if it's the dryness in Europe, um, and we still are trying to deal with are we going to ship grain out of uh, the Ukraine when their, uh, their storage is, uh, is full and they're going into harvest. So, I mean, there's those type of issues that, uh, you know, we got to unlock uh, Ukraine supply somehow, and I think that's going to be probably next week's trade and then the weather trade. In the corn markets, the big news is acres. Exactly how many will we have this year? Once again, Don Rose gives us the details. I think what you have to say is now we still have in play what are the acres going to be? Are we going to get some prevent plant acres? Um, you know, are we going to see acres switched? So this June 30th report, I think, uh, on acres is going to be a big deal. But um, I think the trade is still trying to say that we're going to have, uh, you know, one to two million more corn acres regardless going to plant just what the yield is. And we're probably going to see if we have... Uh, maybe one to two million less soybean acres. And then we also have to get a yield. I don't think they're big switch. I mean, you know, basically there's um, 180 million acres of uh, corn beans in the rotation. I think we try and push those around. Um, with the prices where we're at, we're gonna try and plant those. Um, you know, the prevent plant uh, that we have, uh, you know, you can still take prevent plant and then uh, get 55% of your APH plant to a, a forage type of crop and then you can even decide whether you want to uh, actually take that uh, in plant or if you want to pay back the uh, the insurance so I mean it's there's just a lot of things that are in play here but it's uh, it's going to be a volatile market and I think we're kind of starting to say that listen I know we've got the northern plains but I think we're kind of saying that the crop is basically sort of kind of planted now what's it look like on emergence and you know how's it going to go forward with soybeans, the price keeps rising. Don Rose says tight global supplies are the driving factor right now and gives some advice for the producer. Well, I think when you look at the end of the week, I mean, the soybeans, hard to believe that they're just off of contract highs. We want just a few cents of it. So Monday, uh, Tuesday is probably going to be, you know, what does, can we push through those new highs or not? And, uh, you know, what's uh, China, are they still underneath the market buying soybeans? But we're overbought. We're kind of at the top end of the range. What we've had so far is every time you get this market in a run, um, if you're chasing rallies and chasing breaks, it hasn't been real successful. So, you know, you try and use those. Uh, tools around things to keep yourself managed. The, you know, those wild days, the big swinging markets, I think the producer has to prepare himself because I think those days are ahead of us. I mean, because we, we do have very tight world supplies and, you know, we were counting on South America to bridge the gap. Then we were counting on the Black Sea. We know what happened there counting on Europe and we know they're dry. We're counting on India, they turn dry. Now we're counting on North America. Well, it's wet in Canada and we've got issues here that aren't perfect. So, you know what I mean? We just can't buy a break. Uh, and what we see in the marketplace talking about breaks is the end user, every time we get down to support, get a little oversold, boom, they pop up, support the market again. Now we know as we move in deeper into the season, this risk management tries to come out of the market a little bit. We shoot for these big round numbers. You know, if you can pop through this, uh, uh, make new highs, and you'll get, uh, you know, remember everybody that would be short has a loss, and then the scramble's on in 18. And then, but what we've had, people, uh, the end user does not want to chase the market, but basis levels uh, very tight on corn and soybeans. The producers basically sold out except for his gambling bushels, and, uh, you know, the uh, supply starts in August again on soybeans here. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Mike? Thanks, Zach. Good insights all the way around. A lot of this show has been about supply chains. The plight of the giant meat packer during the early days of the pandemic did open the door for more nimble processors. The local meat locker has served families for generations, and for the last two years, the new norm is a busy one year-round. Once again, Peter Tubbs has more. The employees of the Corning Meat Processing Service are gathered around the cut table on a Wednesday morning, cutting meat for a customer who had a steer processed with the Iowa-based company. Their goal is to finish breaking these sides down, along with the meat from two more steers by the end of the day. 
Tomorrow, they will return to process three more animals from a different customer. The locker has been on this pace for two years since the COVID-19 pandemic put kinks in the meat supply chain, which forced producers and customers to explore new delivery methods, including a direct line from the farm to the table. But it wasn't always this busy for this small town locker. Come in March, April, May has always been kind of a open time. We didn't know we'd, some days we'd cut every, every day. Uh, we'd be booked out maybe a couple weeks at the most. Uh, we went from nothing to do, just very little to do, to book clear full April, May, out for, I went out as far as a year and 10 months, booked solid full, uh, and with a waiting list of probably about 80 people with 120 head of livestock wanting in. So it went absolutely from nice, not you know, like to be a little busier, to absolutely overloaded. The new demand for local meat extended more than 80 miles away from Adams County. We have a lot of people coming from Omaha or Des Moines out of the cities that were looking for meat because they couldn't buy meat uh, in the stores. They were limited to one or two or three pieces in the stores. Uh, so they started digging out into the country looking for, uh, you know, quarters and halves and pork. So it, yeah, they, it extended it way out and brought a lot of new people in that's never, ever experienced a butcher shop. That jump in demand has meant a 40% increase in the number of animals slaughtered at the small facility, and a similar increase in the pounds of meat cut and wrapped by its employees. David Walter has been in the meat business since 1985, when he began working at the Corning Locker. A decade and a half later, he became the owner, and he was glad he had the long lead time to learn the business. I worked for my boss 15 years. I don't regret a time of it. Yeah, you could get by with seven, eight years. It's like I told Jacob, you know, he works with me for five, six, seven years. He's really digging in and finding and learning all about it. You walk into it blindsided, you're going to get blindsided. It's just, it's how it's going to happen. Jacob Cross started working for Walter as a teenager and returned two years ago as a full-time employee. Cross is now planning on buying the locker when Walter retires. We have people that come, even from when I worked here back in 2005, still coming, you know, and so, and Dave's been here a long time before me, you know, and people's grandparents, fathers, now sons, you know, and now their kids are starting to come, and Dave's seen all of them, you know, they remember, you know, so that's kind of cool to be a part of something that generations have always came to this place. The building has been a meat locker since the 1950s, and Walter has continued to renovate the facility. A new refrigeration system was added in 2019, and a value-added producer grant from the USDA financed the purchase of a meat slicer and electric smoker. The tools will help expand the menu into ready-to-eat products they currently don't sell to consumers. When I hired him two years ago to come in and really follow my footsteps and push me to and push things to go and get things to go farther and let him either manage or own this thing down the road. We're looking at doing some new new brats, things for the case to sell, uh, new sticks, different things that way. Local lockers are important to their communities, but the number of animals coming in the door varies more than some new operators might expect. Walter says those looking to get into the business often are in for a surprise. Do you realize what's coming? I said, do you know what's happening and what it is to this business? And so many of them don't know what's, what's going on and what it is. It's just, there's more to it, that side of not, it could go back the other way, just as fast as it is, as busy as we are, which is, can be devastating. Walter has watched his meat processing business ebb and flow with the local weather, but the effect on the number of animals coming in the door has often been delayed by several years. A Southwest Iowa drought in 2012 forced many cattle producers to shrink their herds. Two years later, when those missing cattle would have been ready to harvest, Walter and his employees found themselves without animals to process. I mean, there'd be weeks that we didn't cut nothing on the table, nothing at all. It would just be, you know, maintenance would walk or, you know, try to fix up some things that needed done. Um, painted some, you know, made the place look a little nicer and did some odds and ends, some extra stuff. 
Today, demand from consumers is still strong, but for some, the price of a quarter or side of beef can lead to sticker shock. A lot of those city people reached out when the beef prices started climbing back up and they had to pay out $2,200 or $2,400 in one lump sum. A lot of them people understood and worked with it, but a lot of them didn't understand and couldn't do it because they were used to putting out $150 or $200 a week for, for meat, and you're throwing it all out at once. So it's the budget thing is kind of affected. Iowa has lost 20% of its small to mid-sized locally owned meat lockers since 2010. The succession plan that Cross and Walter have created means that corning meat processing will hopefully buck the trend of small towns losing their lockers as longtime owners retire. You have ways figured out to get people interested in this business uh, because it's needed big time. Kind of a success story. Let's hope the supply chain doesn't fall apart or inflation doesn't interfere. Well, next time on Farm Week, a virus success story, kind of. It struck fear in humans for generations. Now it looks less like this and more like this, rabies. Used to be we worried more about our pets. Now rabies is more likely to come from wildlife and it can still be fatal. So experts fly the country, dropping thousands of special vaccine packets from Maine to Alabama. Winning the war on rabies, that's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. See you next week. Thanks for watching.